The AHA Leadership Dialogue Series focuses on trending topics with healthcare, business, and community leaders from around the country. On this Leadership Dialogue series, AHA Board Chair Wright L. Lassiter III is joined by Matthew Stanley, DO, a psychiatrist and clinical vice president of the Behavioral Health Service Line at Avera Health, based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Wright and Dr. Stanley discuss the impact that COVID-19 has had on people's mental health and new ways to support increased access to behavioral health services across the care continuum. Thank you for joining me today for another leadership dialogue session. I'm Wright Lassiter, and I'm president and CEO of Henry Ford Health, and I'm also the board chair for the American Hospital Association. I'm looking forward to today's conversation as we talk about the critical issue of behavioral health, uh, an issue that has only worsened over the last uh, few years of the pandemic. Uh, behavioral health, uh, I think, as we all know, has been long both stigmatized and underfunded. Uh, and with the mental health crisis in our country worsening, uh, the hospital field uh, has got to be active in developing and advocating for solutions to help uh, American citizens who are suffering from and dealing with uh, behavioral health issues, both uh, patients and families as well as our own caregivers who have been, uh, who have increased rates of anxiety, burnout, and uh, sort of resilience drain. Uh, and Henry Ford, like, uh, like many other organizations, we're working to build uh, a stronger infrastructure to meet uh, behavioral health needs in the communities that we serve. Uh, our organization has uh, three behavioral health facilities, and we certainly recognize the importance of providing comprehensive behavioral health treatment uh, to improve and expand care and to support patients uh, and families in, in our community. Uh, so in our organization, uh, we provide inpatient psychiatric care. Uh, we provide addiction treatment. Uh, we provide comprehensive outpatient psychiatric care for patients of all ages, as well as expanding access to services through our virtual behavioral health uh, options. But now let's jump in and, and let me introduce our guest today. Uh, I'm really pleased to have with me today, uh, Dr. Matthew Stanley. Uh, Dr. Stanley is the Clinical Vice President of Behavioral Health Service Line at Avera Health in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Avera Health is an integrated health system uh, that serves South Dakota and the surrounding areas in uh, Minnesota, uh, in Iowa, in Nebraska, and in North Dakota uh, through a collection of 37 hospitals, uh, more than 200 primary care and specialty clinics, uh, 40 senior living facilities, in addition to home care and hospice and sports and wellness, uh, home medical equipment, uh, and more. Uh, Dr. Stanley has more than 20 years of experience as a psychiatrist at Avera. Uh, he's board certified uh, by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and by the American Board of Addiction Medicine. Uh, he is the attending psychiatrist for Avera McKenna uh, McKenna Behavioral Health Services, and is an investigator at the Avera Research Institute. Uh, among Dr. Stanley's many roles, he continues to pursue his interest uh, in chemical dependency uh, through uh, training residents uh, in, in his field, uh, in supervising the clinical dependency team. Uh, in addition, he is assistant professor of the uh, Department of Psychiatry at the South Dakota Stanford School of Medicine. And he is also the chair elect of the American Hospital Association's Behavioral Health Council. Matt, I would tell you that uh, I know that uh, it was a long uh, intro, but um, I like to tell folks that when we talk to someone's mother about what's the great things about their son, they give us a really great bio. And so this is the kind of bio that we got for you. And so we're really appreciative of you being with us. Uh, I can't thank you enough for joining me today, uh, not only to discuss your uh, work at, at Avera Behavioral Health, but your thoughts on how we can integrate uh, in a much better way uh, behavioral health along with physical health. Um, so thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. I it always, uh, like yourself, I find this, uh, of course, it's my life's work, but uh, I find this a topic that we, we can't discuss enough. And as you said, with everything that's going on uh, in the world today, uh, more relevant than ever. Always been relevant, uh, but uh, I think we're reminded of it daily at this point. 
Wonderful. Well, listen, I, uh, again, I want to appreciate uh, your time for joining me as part of our leadership dialogue session. And let's just jump into some questions. Uh, the best way to do this is just to, uh, we'll start diving in and, uh, and have a good, a good conversation. So let's start with where uh, things always seem to have to start over the last couple of years, and that's with, uh, with COVID. Uh, you know, clearly, as we look back over the last two plus years, um, let's sort of talk about the impact that COVID has had on behavioral health and what trends you've seen uh, in, in the communities you serve and how they've underscored uh, the general need for enhanced behavioral health services uh, in America. Yeah, it's been uh, a lesson every day uh, and uh, continues to change for us. You know, there's both kind of the anecdotal uh, clinical experience we've, we've all kind of been in touch with, and then we're starting to see more and more research that comes out and either validates what we thought or, or even opens our eyes to new uh, concepts. For instance, you know, the, the WHO just put out a new uh, scientific brief that indicated worldwide uh, anxiety and depression were up. Uh, 25% across the world. So, you know, that's a remark. That's the magnitude of change that indicates is remarkable. Mm -hmm. You know, clinically, what we've seen, it, it probably like you in, in Detroit with uh, Henry Ford, you know, we had a lull there for about a month or two at the very opening of the pandemic. And since then, at least in behavioral health, and I think the rest of the hospital as well, you know, it has been floor to ceiling, uh, wall to wall, we have had more patients than we have even, than we've had beds for, providers for. Uh, it has literally been um, becoming more creative, trying to find more ways to support people, finding ways to uh, treat people even outside of the hospital. And I think uh, we see that and we kind of understand it in those that were at risk of COVID and, and in adults who lost their job. I think the wave that we've seen in behavioral health that maybe wasn't so apparent or anticipated is the impact it's had on our children, our adolescents. We have been incredibly impacted in, in the adolescents. Uh, again, we, we've uh, never seen numbers like we are seeing now. And again, the data tells us, you know, the increases in, uh, in children, the depression and anxiety, it's, uh, um, Again, 20, 25% increases across the board. Uh, we're seeing uh, increased ER visits yeah. well over and above what we've seen historically. More thoughts of suicide. If there's the only somewhat promising piece or, or at least a better piece, we haven't seen the tremendous rise in suicide events, uh, although we were already, unfortunately, in the midst of a, an epidemic there. Right. And uh, so we haven't. We haven't gained ground. We just didn't lose ground uh, any faster, if you will. Sure, sure. And then the overdoses. The other thing, I think the the substance use, the impact COVID, the isolation, so much of substance use uh, and recovery is about a community approach. Uh, that was lost to many. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, substance use, as we know, from sales of alcohol and uh, other indicators uh, only went up during the pandemic. And you know, for the first time, we have had uh, over 100,000 deaths in, in the preceding year in overdose alone. So all of these numbers are frightening, and sure. um, we're treading new ground every day with the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. what that bodes for the future, I think, is, is very hard to uh, project at this point. Got it. Well, I really appreciate you sharing some of the data around the rise in stress, anxiety, and, and other conditions and, and the impact on adolescents. Um, I mean, I think it's just something that that many of us know anecdotally, and then when we begin to hear statistics, it helps you uh, hardwire even more uh, clearly um, the challenges that that our country's facing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, hospitals and health systems. I mean, certainly we know that that we play important roles in behavioral uh, health care, and whether it's uh, in our own facilities with our caregivers and and team members or the community members that we interface with um, outside the four walls. Uh, trying to help them c connect with resources uh, that might be available in their community. Um, are there new ways, um, as you think about what's happening today, are there new ways that hospitals and health systems should be looking to support and increase access to behavioral health services um, across the health continuum uh, that you might want to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think we've all uh, become more uh, aware, more in tune with uh, the use of telemedicine. As we all kind of know, that that just took a tremendous leaps. And it's it's 
uh, it had been used very effectively in behavioral health uh, even prior to the uh, uh, pandemic. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it, you know, we, we increased that use by leaps and bounds. Uh, so that I, I think that it continues to provide the greatest hope for uh, reaching more people. A couple of uh, uh, just personal observations. You know, we we run a fairly uh, large uh, telemedicine outreach clinic, and and we have some contracts with some impoverished areas, uh, and very geographically remote. You know, you mentioned I live in South Dakota here, and we serve a five state area, uh, and. Um, so we are very geographically challenged. We often have three, four hours of a drive just for a, a patient to get to a provider, particularly a specialist. So one of the lessons learned was we had uh, contracts with some of these remote areas, uh, relatively impoverished population. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had very high no-show rates prior to the pandemic. In part, uh, as we look back on it, lessons learned. That was because that patient had to drive to a facility in order to complete the telemedicine uh, appointment Hmm. with the CARES Act and the ability to go direct to the consumer. So now they could talk to us on a smartphone. Now they didn't have to find someone to watch their child. They didn't have to pay for gas. They didn't have to find somebody to give them a ride. We actually saw our completion of appointments rise dramatically. So it really had it really made everyone rethink some of the biases that they had. You know, I, I think there was the belief that it just didn't matter as much to these folks or they weren't as committed to their care. None of which I think is true. I think, you know, we were just underestimating the limitations, the barriers that these folks had to overcome in order to get to their appointments. Right. So that's been a tremendous, uh, I think, enlightenment for us. And uh, within that a great opportunity. I, I really, you know, we've really been advocating that the direct to consumer piece of mental health care uh, is continued. And, and right. at this point, it, it looks promising. And I know we still have continuation. Uh, but I, I think that's a critical component. You know, there's other things that have been, uh, I think, successful for health systems, the uh, hospital at home, not so much, I think, in, you know, a behavioral health patients, we're a little different. Mostly the only reason you come into the hospital is if you're a danger to yourself or others, that's kind of Mm -hmm. that uh, typical uh, criteria. So it's very hard to keep someone at home uh, Mm -hmm. when those Mm -hmm. are the concerns. But I think uh, where the opportunity for behavioral health is, is to integrate with the other hospital at home components. Because when we look at things uh, like chronic conditions and Uh containing the, you know, creating wellness there and containing the cost and the morbidity that behavioral health component is incredibly important. People that are depressed or anxious, you know, they're not able to be as compliant. They're not able to function as well. Obviously their quality of life isn't as, as, uh, as good either. So I think those are a couple of the, a couple of the opportunities for us uh, that really jump out from this pandemic experience. I appreciate that. I would tell you, you know, as you talk about, um, the continuation of, of support that uh, that's necessary to uh, to to fund and provide appropriate reimbursement for behavioral health to be delivered directly to consumers. That's certainly something that the American Hospital Association is working very hard in Washington uh, to advocate for and help people understand uh, the value of that. So certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, Matt, as we were doing research about all of, all the great things you all are doing in South Dakota and 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 more broadly at Avera. We learned a bit about uh, behavioral health urgent care service program that you all have created. Um, can you just tell us a bit more about how that's operating and and the impact that's having on on service provision and and on the outcomes that you all are trying to affect in, in your region? Absolutely, yeah, very happy to talk about it. So urgent care uh, is a little different than maybe we're all familiar with urgent care at the primary care kind of level, the the level below an emergency room, but we went specifically to behavioral health to create an urgent care to. Re- try to improve a couple of, uh, I think, chronic problems. One is access to care in behavioral health. Uh, we'll, and quite honestly, I think we've all said it, we'll never have enough psychiatrists uh, to, to meet all the needs out there, uh, but folks still need to, to get somewhere to get, uh, get care initiated. I think the other thing that's difficult in behavioral health, and, <laughs> behavioral health care is that, um, it's hard to navigate 
behavioral health. There, it is a it is a more uh, fractured health delivery system than most. Mm-hmm. Um, and primary care is still a great point to start, but a lot of patients aren't comfortable with that. Right. So with the urgent care, it, we have essentially created a, a walk-in opportunity, very different than an emergency room. It's designed to be uh, friendly to patients that are going through an emotional crisis, often have family members with them, uh, quite frankly, often are brought in by police in our urgent care or uh, brought in by uh, uh, transport from another facility. And it's, um, it is staffed then by a uh, uh, master's level counselor, a nurse, behavioral okay. health techs, mm-hmm. and then advanced practice providers in uh, uh, health care. Okay. So the idea is to give you a very comprehensive evaluation, just like you get in an ER. Uh, we're not called an ER because we don't do trauma and some of those things. Right. But it's the idea that here's this opportunity to walk in, get a comprehensive evaluation, get you placed at the right level of care. So some of these patients will go directly into the hospital for margin care. Mm-hmm. We also have a crisis stabilization unit attached to that. So that's a 23-hour observation level of care. Okay. For folks that are somewhere in that gray zone, don't don't quite need to go into the hospital. You know, it's attached to our partial hospital program, so we can refer them to a day hospital. So essentially, right, what we've tried to do is build out a full spectrum of care and have a single entry point uh, to help consumers navigate and get it get to the right level of care at the right time for them uh, to really kind of resolve their uh, behavioral health issue. I really appreciate uh, that that explanation and and just certainly applaud Avera for the work that you all are doing for what you all are leading in the in the communities that you serve. You used uh, you used the I word a couple of times uh, in in the last uh, conversation, and so let's just maybe talk a little bit about that I word. And people might say, well, what's the I word? And that word's integration. Um, and there's so many ways you can talk about integration of healthcare services, but I think historically. Um, we all uh, acknowledge that there is a bit of a, a disintegration currently between behavioral medicine and physical medicine, but yet um, um, all the research that, that you see would suggest that we need to do a better job of integrating physical and behavioral medicine. I think you've talked a little bit about that w- uh, with some of your prior um, uh, answers to, to questions that I posed, but just anything else you want to talk about in terms of the opportunity for us to do a better job of integration between behavioral and physical medicine that might be useful uh, for, for our listeners? Yeah, well, I appreciate you bringing it up because I, I think it's probably the most critical thing that we need to uh, focus on over the next several years. It's been such uh, a, a da- I think that artificial dichotomy that somehow there's a difference between mental health and physical health you know, it, it's been so damaging, I think, to the um, to the behavioral health world, but also uh, physical health for years. Uh, and as you said, you know, all our evidence, all our all our scientific uh, foundation indicates, you know, these the human body is uh, one living organism that involves both uh, behavioral health and physical health, if you even want to use those terms. But I think uh, several things. I think one of the reasons that we struggle so much with access is uh, across the country, we don't have um, an acceptance that uh, behavioral health should be uh, a part of your medical care, uh, should be uh, addressed with your primary care physician, should actually be a component of every, every time you touch base with, uh, with your health care provider. And I think until we overcome that, now some people do it wonderfully and some systems have addressed it uh, very aggressively. Uh, and I, I think they're reaping the benefits, but we still struggle with that. And, and you know, it, 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 it's, it's uh, effects are kind of insidious. I think everything you mentioned, reimbursement, uh, I think because it's so, we're somehow seen as a different branch of medicine, there's often reimbursement issues. Uh, I think contributes to stigma. The fact that uh, often it's, it's something you wouldn't even bring up in your primary care office because it's you're embarrassed or they act like they don't want you to mention that here. That's not what we treat. So there are a number of challenges there. But in order to get a hold of, uh, get a handle on, um, you know, the things we're talking about, increasing suicide rates, substance use rates, increasing depression and anxiety, you know, it really needs to begin uh, with our uh, primary care partners and uh, really has to prove 
you know, be pervasive throughout every level of our healthcare. You know, I did mention that, um, you know, there, there's significant data that indicates if you're managing any chronic disease and you're not at concurrently managing a behavioral health issue, mm-hmm. your costs and patient outcomes are going to go uh, in the wrong direction. So uh, there's both, uh, I think, societal repercussions and mm-hmm. I think, you know, healthcare repercussions if we don't focus more on integration. Now, yeah. I, think the, I think the difficulty, the trick is, uh, you know, kind of choreographing the move between uh, back and forth between primary care and behavioral mm-hmm. health and making sure the right access points and supports are available. Uh, so those are, you know, that's one of the challenges, but I think sure. primarily we need to just accept this as uh, medical disease, disease of the brain, if you will, and uh, move forward. Great. Well, um, let me just pose one last question to you because I, I, we, we try to keep these, uh, these dialogues to a manageable level so that, uh, so that our, our uh, listeners uh, uh, have, a, have a, uh, a good session that's not too, too long. Um, and you talked a little bit previously about um, reimbursement and the challenges that exist there. And I think we, we would all acknowledge that, um, that there's been an inadequate reimbursement framework for behavioral health services. And, um, and in addition to that, there's been a shortage of necessary personnel to deliver the services that, that many citizens across the country need. Um, and so clearly over the last couple of years, that, that probably has gotten worse in some ways, even, even though we have had enhanced reimbursement for things like telemedicine and, 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 and video connection directly to consumers. But there's not necessarily been um, a, a fundamental change in in the reimbursement for behavioral health services per se. Um, so maybe just talk a little bit about you know from your perspective how um, inadequate reimbursement has has driven some of the trends that we see in in both uh, shortage of of both uh, clinical personnel, uh, behavioral health workers. Uh, you know how does and how does this dearth of reimbursement contribute to the inequities that we see in, in many communities related to uh, the, the, the provision of behavioral health services and, and frankly, the ability of, of uh, individuals to live their, bel- their best selves. Well, I think, and I think you identified it. I think the, the lack of reimbursement has led to some of our workforce issues. Now, workforce is, uh, is difficult across a number of uh, professions at this point in time, but uh, it's been years since we have had uh, an adequate number of mental health providers. Uh, and there's some frightening statistics out there. I think more than 50% of all psychiatrists are in the last decade of practice. Uh, so this, uh, rather than this improving, there's a uh, real potential for it to become worse. I think the other thing uh, that um, we maybe underestimate is, you know, healthcare systems have to, um, pursue a margin just to stay operational. Although we're nonprofit, we're mission driven. Mm -hmm. uh, We are trying to do the right thing for the patients and uh, for our um, employees. Uh, But we still have to pursue, you know, where the dollars are in order to keep the doors open. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, chronically underpaying or, uh, you know, limited reimbursement for behavioral health has led to issues like not enough psychiatric beds, no new facilities being built or very few facilities being built, mm-hmm. you know, a, a reduction in, I think, in people interested in going into mental health. One of our biggest struggles right now are nurses that are interested in and trained in behavioral health. Mm-hmm. Um, so even when we can get providers and have beds, we're sometimes uh, challenged with staffing. So I, I do think that is, uh, a tremendous challenge for us. It's not something that will turn around immediately. Uh, it's going to be uh, several years, even if we get the um, get equities in in payment. Uh, it will take a while to turn that ship. But um, I, I I can't tell you how uh, thankful I am that the American Hospital Association has put their weight behind this effort and uh, recognized it as an issue that needs to be addressed. Well, uh, Dr. Matt Stanley. Um, I appreciate you uh, joining me today and sharing uh, perspectives. Um, um, I, I really enjoy these leadership dialogues, but what I find is that we could always spend another 30 minutes talking about more issues related to the topics we have. Um, but I appreciate you sharing insights around uh, behavioral health, um, around the successes that Avera is having in, in addressing the needs that you all are, are serving in your five state community. Um, and how we can best support behavioral health uh, services, behavioral health providers, uh, workers, and uh, how we can integrate 
behavioral health into uh, whole person care. So uh, very appreciative of that. And I know this topic uh, is one that can benefit all of our listeners, whether they're in the behavioral health field directly or in more broadly in, in hospital and health and health services. Um, I encourage anyone who's uh, struggling uh, with uh, feelings of anxiety or depression to please reach out um, uh, to those who can provide support for you so that um, you can get the services that you need. I would also just say to our listeners that you can uh, you can tune in to uh, visit AHA.org uh, and the AHA's Physician Alliance website for additional resources that are focused on stress, uh, coping, and mental health uh, for healthcare workers. And until next time, I uh, thank you for joining us for today's Leadership Dialogues. I hope you'll be back for next month's Leadership Dialogues. Thanks very much.